Welcome to the Deconstructionist Podcast. I'm your host, John Williamson, and we're back with a brand new guest this week. Uh, a little heads up, uh, for those who are sensitive to language, there's a little uh, course language used throughout the episode. Um, and also, uh, the subject matter is in regards to cults. So if that's something that's uh, particularly triggering for you, uh, just keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, so we're talking about cults this week. And uh, I was referred a, a wonderful guest uh, by my former brother-in-law, Kevin, uh, who's been on the podcast a couple times. Uh, he's a comedian out of New York, and he has a friend, fellow comedian from New York, Doug Smith, who uh, happened to be a former member of the Jehovah's Witnesses and has a podcast about it called Jehovah Boy. And so uh, where he talks about sort of uh, deconstructing or sort of unwinding or unpacking um, his experience in a what is considered an apocalyptic group, you know, who focus very much on the end times. And so uh, we've talked a little, it's been a while. We had a guest for those of you who've been around for a while or have done a deep dive into our catalog. Um, we had cult expert Steve Hassan on uh, back in, I think, 2016. He wrote a wonderful book that's very, very interesting and, and informative called Combating Cult Mind Control. Uh, it's the number one best selling guide to protection, rescue, and recovery for, from destructive cults. He himself was a member of a cult as well and has spent a lifetime trying to figure out. Uh, how they tick. And um, I think initially he talks about in our interview, um, you know, trying to figure out why he was a target initially and, you know, why and how otherwise very intelligent uh, people sort of get pulled into these things. And there are certain techniques that are common throughout. And so it's fascinating to have Doug on to talk about his experience in the first person, um, you know, his firsthand experiences and sort of how his life was impacted by it and sort of the, um, residual effects after he left. So, uh, fascinating conversation. We'll get to, uh, www.thedeconstructionist.com is our website where you can go to read our blogs, working on a new one right now, uh, that should be up here within the next week. Um, also all of our back catalog of episodes going all the way back to 2016. So 175 plus episodes you can stream for free through the website, uh, the main page there. Um, in addition, there's links to our Patreon if you want to support us there. Um, in addition, there is a brand new link um, on our uh, website to our brand new web store that has a ton of new options and also direct-to-print shipping. So it's must, much faster shipping direct to you and uh, tons of other uh, brand new options and designs on there. So check it out if that's something you're interested in. Otherwise, let's get to it. Without further ado, I give you Doug freaking Smith. Do you believe in hope? Because I am hopeless. Do you believe in love? Because I'm alone. All right. Welcome to the Deconstructionist Podcast. I've got my guest on, Doug Smith. Thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to be with me. Thank you, John. Good to be here. Absolutely. So, uh, my boy, Kevin, uh, it's always awkward when I introduce him now. Cause I'm like former brother-in-law, but like, it's not weird for us. So it shouldn't be for anybody <laughs> else either. <laughs> hey, for what it's worth, I am closer to my former brother-in-law than I am to my own sister. So Perfect. somehow the, somehow that's how it works. <laughs> hey, you know, uh, sometimes family is, uh, you know, comes in strange forms and fashion. So all good. But, uh, yeah, I was talking to Kevin, and and Kevin said, "Hey, I got a buddy who's got a story uh, that you might be interested in talking about." So, before we get into that, though, uh, tell me a little bit about tell folks about who you are, and um, and maybe we can get into a little bit about your background. Okay, sure. Uh, I wear many hats, John. I am a husband, father, and comedian in New York City, um, desperately trying to uh, shake off the repercussions of my Jehovah's Witness upbringing. I was, uh, I was in the Jehovah's Witness organization for 20 years, born into it. And um, so my mom was one of the few people that was actually converted. I don't know. Wh- where are you located again? Columbus, Ohio. Columbus, Ohio. Okay. Yeah. They, have, they, have, they have boots on the ground in Columbus, I assume. Have you had them come oh. to your door? Absolutely. Especially in my neighborhood. Um, there was a, uh, a, a nice older lady who used to come all the time and she was, uh, she was not uh, what I would call overly aggressive. So I always like would chat with her. She'd give me the magazine, you know, uh, it was only once when she brought a guy with her and he started to, uh, t- tell me about the end of the world and, you know, get things got weird. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 They'll, uh, they'll keep coming back unless you hit them with the hose or sick your dog on them. 
<laughs> yeah. They need a they need a hard no. Um, but yeah, most people uh, do not convert from their door to door ministry. Most people, at best, like you, will give them, you know, a couple of minutes just to be polite. But most of the time, they get the door slammed in their face, or you know, if if at all, most people just don't even answer the door at all. They hide behind the couch and wait for them to leave. Um, but my mom was one of the few people who they she had Jehovah's Witnesses. So I actually didn't know the full story until a couple of years ago. And when I found out the truth, I was kind of flabbergasted. But so uh, the truth is that my parents were living in my hometown, Ridgefield, Connecticut. And Jehovah's Witnesses came to the door uh, on a day where my dad happened to come home to let they had a new puppy. He came home to let the puppy outside give him a little bathroom break and and some lunch. And Jehovah's Witnesses came to the door while my dad was home and gave him their whole pitch. And he said, you know what? This isn't something that I'm really uh, interested in, but why don't you come back tomorrow when my wife is here? And they did. They came back when my mom was there and she, boom, fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. So after all these years of blaming my mom, I now all the all the fault lies with my father for inviting them back a second day. <laughs> Unusual. Yeah. Yes, yes. I yeah, I'm sure they did a double take. What you want us to come back? Yeah. So um that's how it all happened. And um yeah, twenty years in the trenches. So I'm the youngest of of four and uh all my siblings, they're much older than me. They're fourteen, sixteen, and eighteen years older than me, and they all um, you know, have functioning brains. So within, 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 uh, time when they hit their teen years, they, um, started to exert their own willpower a little bit more and, and eventually fled the organization. And then all this pressure was put on me to kind of, uh, make up for the sins of my siblings. So I was, uh, I was, the, I was the chosen one that was meant to fall in line and, um, and uh, fight the good fight, and and stay in the stay in the organization. And um, then my mom passed away suddenly when I was seventeen, and that that honestly was open the door for my dad and I to to leave after we had kind of just been going along with it for a long time. And uh, we kept it up for another three years because that's all we knew. It's a it's a you know it's a very insular community. It's 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 like a bubble. It's very restrictive and um, reclusive in a way. So even though the door was wide open for me to go out into the world and sow my wild oats, I knew nothing outside of that community. So it took me three years to finally gain the courage to be like, I'm done, peace out. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the cliff notes of my, of my story with the organization. Wow. It, so... I think a lot of people listening are probably much like myself in the sense that like, I know a little bit about it. Like I had some friends who I used to work with went back in my teenage years at target who I knew were Jehovah's witnesses and knew that they don't celebrate birthdays or something like that. And we would see the building, but like give folks like kind of the, the high level overview of what, what the belief system consists of. Sure. It's funny to me because of, of all the, of all the cults out there and they're, there's so many more than I ever knew about. Cult stuff is all the rage these days. Every I feel like every other day there's a new cult documentary on Netflix. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I feel like Scientologists have been the fall guys for a long time, and <laughs> you know there's plenty of dark, weird shit that goes on there. But I don't even think they're the the worst, and I don't Jehovah's Witnesses are not really a far cry from that, um, especially their belief system. I often say it sounds it, their, their belief system kind of seems like if somebody just ripped ripped out the pages of several different sci-fi books and then just jumbled them all together. So they basically believe that uh, they believe in in original sin. They believe that um, sin was brought about through Adam and Eve eating that forbidden fruit, and um, we are um, um, sin was introduced that way. And we are living under Satan's regime. This world is under Satan's control. 
Uh, the outside world is referred to as Babylon the Great in their organization, and there's all this imagery that they use. So, so uh, my logo for my podcast, Jehovah Boy, which was my nickname in seventh grade, um, my logo for my podcast is kind of a spinoff on on the um, imagery used to depict Babylon the Great, which is a drunken harlot riding <laughs> atop a seven headed horned leopard looking beast and ah. it's really cool it's pretty fucking metal <laughs> stuff if you ask me so very so early real, on as a real kid. revelation <laughs> okay yes 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 so um yeah even as a kid I was, that was an image that was supposed to like you know instill me with fear and i was like that's cool i want that i want to go to the dark side <laughs> so uh they basically believe that we're living under satan's rule and that um we are uh we have been instructed by Jehovah that this is the this is the one true religion, as most extremist religious groups believe that they have the one true religion, and it is our mission to spread the news of God's kingdom far and wide, uh to prepare everybody to give them a chance to survive Armageddon. And they believe that Armageddon is very close at hand, yet they have falsely predicted Armageddon multiple times. So when the organization first started, they believed that Armageddon was coming in 1914. 1914 came and went. They were like, "Uh, I think we were a little bit off on the math. It's coming in uh, 1975. 75 came and went. Oh, shit. Uh, 2000. It's coming in 2000. That came and went. And now they've they've, uh, at least have enough smarts to be like, you know what? We're not going to hit a put a, a, a an exact date on it we're just gonna say it's close all right just trust us it's very close at hand so they have been preaching this forever which is a bit of a tragedy because so many jehovah's witnesses have not invested in their lives on this planet in this system of things because they have put all their chips on Armageddon coming and wiping everything out. And they believe that when Armageddon comes and obliterates 99.9% of the world's population that are non-believers, that uh, the earth will be transformed into a paradise where all of Jehovah's true believers, uh, living and dead, they believe that the dead will be resurrected so all of Jehovah's true believers will live uh, forever in perfect harmony with animals. So man and beast living as one uh, in perfect harmony on this paradise earth forever. And they believe that a select few referred to as the 144,000 that have received this divine calling from Jehovah, uh, they will be resurrected to heaven when they die to rule over this paradise earth and serve as king priests alongside Jesus to rule over this paradise earth, which again, ruling, what, what do you need to rule over an earth full of perfect people? You know, what's the need (laughs) for the, for the rule there? It's a pretty ridiculous belief system. And, um, it's all about fear mongering. You know, you're being, you're Mm -hmm. being constantly reminded that, Armageddon is close, and if you fuck up and you don't put, uh, you don't fall in line and and follow the rules to a T, which there are many. It's it's all about restrictions. So as you hinted at, no, no birthdays, no holidays of any sort, and that's just that's a drop in the bucket, you know. So no, no uh, uh, alcohol or drug abuse, no tattoos. You can't vote. Um, you can't join the military. Uh, there's no. No premarital sex, no dating before marriage, uh, no masturbation. And these are all like punishable offenses. It's not just like a finger wag. Like if you get caught doing any of these things, you are out on your ass and you're ostracized and you're completely cut off from your friends and family. So it's all, it's very much dependent on fear mongering and um, basically being threatened with abandonment if you. If you leave, if you stray from their belief system, wow! So there's there's no three strike policy there. You violate any of those, uh, you know, rules, and and you're immediately kicked out. That's that's it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, within 
Basically, they tell you that if you are truly repentant, if you drop to your knees and, and, and beg for mercy, they might give you another shot. But nine times out of ten, yeah, you get caught, you're out on your ass. And, and one of the things that I forgot to mention uh, that most people actually wind up getting this fellowship for uh, because it's a very easy slip up to make is smoking. You get caught smoking a cigarette. That is grounds for divorce. And the irony there is uh, Jehovah's Witnesses cannot get divorced. The only grounds for divorce is adultery. So I actually saw you, – you're familiar with um, that that uh, that Scientology program that Le- Leah Remini had on uh, Netflix. Yes. Did you see that? Yep. So did. she did. She did a full episode just a, just on Jehovah's Witnesses, which was remarkable. I highly recommend it. And she had about ten or twelve Jehovah's Witnesses directly talking about their experience. Really, really tragic stuff. In, in every person, in, in their own unique way, experienced absolute horrible things due to their involvement in the in this cult. Which I've also come to realize. It is, it is absolutely a cult. It was started by one man. It's run by basically the governing body, as they call it, which is like a, the Supreme Court of the Jehovah's Witnesses. It's eight old white guys. They got one, one token black guy in the mix, the Clarence Thomas of the mix. And, uh, but other than that, it's like he is uh, the, the governing body, make up all the rules, and um, they... Uh, you know, so that it's run by, it's run by a person or people. There is money that is donated by its members that is funneled up the ladder to fund everything, and uh, of course the ostracization that happens or the shunning that happens if you question anything or stray from the belief system at all. So it checks all the boxes. You know, if you if you look, what makes a cult? It absolutely is, which, of course, they, as uh, with most cults, they also deny that, uh, you know, thoroughly. But uh, what was I hinting at? Oh, yeah, so the smoking thing. So in this um, Leah Remini episode about Jehovah's Witnesses, there was one woman who got married very young, which, again, a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses, they get married very young, as soon as they can, because there's no premarital sex. So they, they just want to, they're horny teenagers that just want to get <laughs> laid. So they get married to the first person that gives them the time of day. And then they realize that they have no chemistry. And then you're stuck in this miserable marriage because there's no grounds for divorce. The only one is adultery. And this one woman was married to this guy who was horribly abusive, like beat her within an inch of her life multiple times. She was actually still disfigured from the abuse by this ex-husband of hers and was not able to divorce the guy because he didn't cheat on her. He was allowed to beat her mercilessly every day, but he didn't cheat on her. So the elders were like, hey, you got to leave this in God's hands. Uh, Maybe you should watch the way you talk to this guy. Basically, seriously, like, you know, he is, it's, it's very, um, it's very, uh, antiquated in their, in their treatment of women as well. Women are viewed as the weaker vessel and to be, and they're taught to be subservient to the man. You know, their husband is, is just one rung below God. So, uh, the elders told her countless times, like, you know, there's nothing you can do here and, uh, you got to stay with this guy and just, just, uh, Pray that he uh, he eventually sees uh, <laughs> sees the error of his ways and stops beating the shit out of you every day. And uh, it went on for years and years and years. And then finally, this woman was able to take a video of this man smoking a cigarette, and that was his ultimate undoing. He was disfellowshipped. That's what they call getting uh, kicked out of the religion. He was disfellowshipped, and then since he was now out of the organization, that was the one other grounds for being able to end this marriage with him. Wow. (laughs) A camel light may have saved her life. That's remarkable. Yes. Good grief. Yeah. There are, interestingly, a lot of... um, 
similarities there between what you're describing and, and some facets of evangelical Christianity, especially in North America, where um, you know, it's a lot of shame-based culture and a lot of like, if, if you don't, you know, fall in line and believe these certain things or, you know, or else, you know, and it, which is, you know, we talk a lot about in the podcast is a terrible way. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not a change of heart. A change of heart isn't occurring here. You know, you are just falling in line because you are scared shitless. That's ultimately what's happening here. And that never seems to last. We see stories of this all over the place, cult or not, like even within sort of more mainstream Christianity, we see that happen. Yeah. So like, Talk, talk about what that was like, though, growing up, because you were, it sounds like fairly young, you know, and you were born into it. And so how did that affect your sort of everyday life and your upbringing? It's extremely demanding in terms of your time and energy. I mean, to be a devout Jehovah's Witness is a, is kind of a full-time job. So in addition to daily prayer and Bible study, there are, uh, they actually cut back to two now, which I think is hilarious. But when I was growing up, there were three church services every week, and their church is called the Kingdom Hall. So uh, three times a week, you have to go to the Tuesday night, Thursday night, and and Sunday morning or afternoon. Uh, you are to report to the Kingdom Hall for a, a basically a two hour service every time. Uh and that is in addition to going out, knocking on doors at least every weekend. So it is, uh, you know, my, my weekends weren't free. And during the summertime, when most kids would be, that's you know, chomping at the bit to have their summers wide open to spend as they want, um, I did something called pioneering. And pioneering is when you devote a certain number of hours per month to the ministry. So there's a lot of people out there that uh, you're basically taught to work as little as possible, have the most menial manual labor job possible that will not uh, distract you or si- mental acuity so that you can be fully focused on the task at hand of being a good upstanding Jehovah's witness. So a lot of these, a lot of Jehovah's witnesses are financially destitute because higher education is off the table. They don't want anybody teaching you how to be self-serving and and self-sufficient rather and think for yourself and aspire to anything greater than the organization. So there's a lot of poverty in in the organization. A lot of people work, uh, you know, very low paying jobs so they can devote as much time and energy into the ministry as possible. And every summer it was uh, at the behest of my mother, I had to, uh, spend one month of the summer. I had to devote 60 hours in the ministry. So basically every day I was out for, I could, you know, however you get to that 60 hours is up to you. It would either be two hours every single day for the month, or, you know, if I wanted some days off, I would have to front load it, you know, maybe spend like five hours a day for one week and maybe five hours a day the next week. Uh, but it was grueling, you know, so you're getting doors slammed in the fa- in your face all the time. I do think, you know, try and always find silver linings and look on the bright side. I do feel like being raised as Jehovah's Witness definitely prepared me for a comedy career or a career in show business, just <laughs> constant rejection left and right. Sure, sure. Uh, lots of no's, lots of not interested. But um, yeah, so, so the demand there just in terms of being uh, – an upstanding member of the organization. It's, it's exhausting. And in addition to that, uh, the restrictions, so no holidays, um, not being able to participate really in anything outside of the organization. So like I went to public school, but a lot of kids in my congregation were homeschooled because Hmm. the thing there is, which You know, uh, honestly, if you want to keep your kids, uh, keep the blinders on and keep them really kind of um, immersed in this in this bubble, homeschooling really is the best way to do that. Because up until the age of five or six, that's all I knew was this organization. And then I go to school and I see all these kids that are living these happy-go-lucky, you know, fruitful 
lives where they have certain freedoms and joys in life that I did not have. And you're just faced with constant temptation of all these things that you can't partake in. So even outside of holidays, you know, couldn't go to school dances, couldn't play sports, couldn't do any extracurricular activities because I'm not allowed to associate with anyone outside of the organization. It's like you go to school because it's mandated by law. You go to school, you get your education, and then you are to report immediately back to home. You're not to fraternize with anybody that is a non-believer. So I was a pretty, you know, I was pretty affable, likable kid. And so I was having to turn down play dates left and right when I was in kindergarten. And then, you know, you get into middle school, uh, having people, having girls ask you to go to a dance. You're like, I can, I'm a Jehovah's witness. And they're like, I guess that means you're gay. Okay. Uh, oh <laughs> you, you know, uh, get into high school. I was a fairly athletic kid, but I wasn't allowed to play sports. Wasn't allowed to go to prom, you know, wasn't allowed to go to any parties. So you're just constantly faced with all these temptations that you're not allowed to partake in. And, um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was tough. I was constantly just seeing what the, what the possibilities were in the outside world, but also knew that if I was to partake, I would be out on my ass and I would, all the, this community that had been supporting me, um, would completely on the drop of a dime would, would have nothing to do with me. And I knew that it would break my mom's heart too, because like I said, all my siblings left. So there was all, all this pressure placed on me to kind of. This week's episode is brought to you by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre-proportioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. So whether your resolution is to save money, eat better, or stress less, HelloFresh is here to help you do all three. Say hello to your most delicious year yet with fresh ingredients and chef-crafted recipes at a price you'll like, delivered right to your door. So you've resolved to actually sit down and eat dinner around the table, but what do you do about those nights when your schedule is packed? Turn to HelloFresh's lineup of quick and easy meals, including their 15-minute recipes designed to help minimize mealtime stress. So if you are like me and you have a full-time job and a kid and uh, you host two pot, okay, maybe that's oddly specific, but if you have a lot going on in your life and you ate a lot of sugary things over Christmas time, then HelloFresh is the way to go. They're going to deliver fresh meals, healthy meals, and quick meals straight to your doorstep, and that's why I love them. So go to HelloFresh.com slash Deconstruct Free and use code Deconstruct Free for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash Deconstruct Free with code Deconstruct Free. America's number one meal kit. This week's episode is brought to you by Factor. Get started on your resolutions with Factor so you're ready for the new year. Factor's ready-to-eat meal delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery store's prep work and cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. With over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more... Plus, over 55 weekly add-ons, you'll have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. So if you're like me, and you're busy, and you also ate way too many sugary things over the holidays, and you need to get back on track, uh, go with Factor. Forget frantic lunch preps and rush dinners. Factor's two-minute meals are your secret weapon in the new year. Fuel up fast with restaurant-quality meals, all delivered right to your door. So it's super, super convenient. So head over to factormeals.com slash deconstruct50 and use code deconstruct50 to get 50% off. That's code deconstruct50 at factormeals.com slash deconstruct50 to get 50% off. Uh, uh, You know, make up for their sins and and toe the line. So it's it's pretty demanding. Yeah, and and, um, as you you mentioned, you know, all your siblings kind of leaving – before that, I'm sure you know. Um, I'm sure there were attempts made by your by your siblings to try to talk your mom out of it. And oh, like yeah. when you're 
when you were so indoctrinated at that point, you know, we talked to a cult expert years ago, um, just about the different techniques and things that groups like that use. And, you know, one of them is anything you read that's outside of the, you know, sort of approved curriculum is, is of the devil. It's bad. Mm -hmm. You can't read it. So it, it becomes very, very difficult because of course, immediately anything you say that's contrary to the belief system of that organization, like, of course, that's that. Of course you would say that that's what the, uh, the, the evil ones want you to think, you know? So, it's almost like this immediate defense mechanism that kicks in that is intentional, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, when I was growing up, I'm, I'm 40. So coming up through the late eighties, early nineties, even into the late nineties, the internet then was not nearly what it is now, obviously. So there was not all this access. Like I, I think it's, a truly beautiful thing that Jehovah's Witness kids now have access to beliefs outside of what they're being raised to believe and, and all this access to articles, videos, um, uh, podcasts, all this stuff that is reinstating the fact that this is a very, very, very dangerous cult. And, uh, that there is that there is an out, and they're able to hear firsthand experiences of people that were raised in this that were able to get out and live fruitful, happy lives on the outside. Because you are taught when you're in it that if you stray from it, you're going to be destitute. You're going to be a homeless junkie, you know, splayed out in the gutter in your own shit. You know, they, they're just constant fear mongering in in every facet you can imagine. Uh, that you're just going to get consumed by this evil, pagan, worldly system of things. So, uh, yeah, it's now it's it's uh, you know I didn't I didn't really have any um, resource growing up for what could be you know and and anybody that was on the outside I, w- I didn't have access to them. So my own brothers. Uh, who were who, one one brother in particular who disassociated himself? That's like that's like the equivalent of being like, I'm not fired, I quit. So before he even got disfellowshipped, he wrote a letter to the elders saying, basically, you know, fuck you guys, I'm out of here. And he left of his own accord, which is even worse, you know, like to 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 plant your flag in that in that kind of apostasy and that that is how he's he's viewed now and myself wow. too by proxy and you know like i have this podcast where i'm basically trying to um it's not i'm not trying to become too bitter and resentful about it because i uh i don't know i i think that's there's a place for that. But, um, and I, like I said, I am trying to look for, always trying to look for silver linings of what it did instill me with certain values and certain skill set. Um, but for the most part, I, I too am, am considered an, an apostate now. And, but I wasn't allowed to speak to this brother of mine. Once he was disassociated, he was completely cut off from my entire family. So I went years at a time without seeing him or speaking to him. So, um, the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses now that want an out and are able to have access to various media that can, in, in, you know, show them that there is a way out, I think is really remarkable. Yeah. So talk about that a little bit. That's, that's kind of interesting because you mentioned earlier in the conversation that, you know, they're not particularly, you know, getting, growing, uh, their base via, you know, the door to door sort of, uh, sales pitch as it were, um, so it sounds like they're growing mostly via, you know, the, the fact that they're having kids and they're expanding in that way. But yeah. as you said, with the, uh, you know, the technology that we have before us, it seems like it might be more difficult to sustain a growing movement. So what's your sense? Yes. And do you have any insight in terms of, is it shrinking? Like, are they having more difficulty, like maintaining, you know, what, what's that look like now? They are, yeah, and I apologize. I kind of got off base from what you originally asked me. They, their numbers are shrinking, and they too, like you hinted at earlier, they are very much discouraged from from using the internet basically at all. And it's like it's it's part of our 
culture now. I mean, everybody has a smartphone. I mean, it's, it's, you are immersed in the world of the internet. So you, you are really constantly surrounded by these outside ideas, even if they're not coming f- directly from apostates, you are surrounded by and being infiltrated with ideas that directly conflict with the belief system of the organization. So they're constantly, it's like, you know, whipping around a fly swatter, just deflecting all these, uh, these pagan, evil, immoral uh, beliefs that they think could be uh, very damaging and, and could contaminate the, the foundation of their organization. So their, their um, attempts to um, not, not even necessarily convert people, but to keep people that are even born into the organization um, out, uh, keep them shielded from those outside influences. I don't know how they do it. And I think any kid that has their finger on the pulse, even remotely that has a social media account or has access to YouTube or Spotify or any of the things that we use on our devices on a daily basis, it's just a matter of time before they start to, question things. And, you know, I questioned things as a kid, but I couldn't do a Google search. I couldn't (laughs) look, I couldn't look up, are Jehovah's Witnesses a cult? Is this bullshit? Is Armageddon real? Is premarital sex gonna, um, uh, is, is that going to ensure my place in hell? You know, like I wasn't able to look any of that up and get any sort of outside information. So, the fact that that kids now are able to find out firsthand without their parents being able to do anything about it other than possibly just not allow them to have a, but there's so many ways to go around that, you know, even if their parents are like, no smartphone, if I get you caught on the, like they can go to the library. Like there, there's, right. if you want to question things, you will find out the truth. So, the fact that their numbers are dropping is not surprising to me at all. And the fact that, I mean, I I can't, I can't imagine being, I I think that there are so many people and there's terms now that are being used in the Jehovah's witness organization that I was not, that didn't exist when I was growing up. So one of them is, is PMO and, and uh, POMO, which is acronyms. PMO is physically in mentally out. And POMO is physically out, mentally out. So I would be POMO, I suppose. But there are plenty of PMOs. Sounds insane. <laughs> Anybody that's just tuning in right now or skipped ahead is like, what the <laughs> fuck? Is this guy having a stroke? So people that are <laughs> people that are PMO, physically in, mentally out, um, it's because, and I'm sure that there are legions of them at this point, people that know that it's bullshit. They know that there is a world that exists outside that would be lead to much greater happiness and, and contentment and allow for so many more opportunities and possibilities that stay in the organization because it's all they know. And, and out of fear of losing their family and friends and the support system that they've had around them their whole lives. So there's a lot of Jehovah's witnesses that are, you know, that are faking the funk and really half-assing it just out of fear because they're afraid to really, you know, jump in the pool of the, of Babylon, the great head first. Yeah. Um, talk about that a little bit. Like what was the thing that first started to, to form a crack for you in the whole thing? And then I think what would be interesting for listeners now is like, where do you find yourself now? Because for a lot of folks, you know, a lot of folks who are listening, you know, in fact, have had some sort of maybe not, you know, experience with a cult, but certainly had traumatic religious experiences at some point along the way. And you can go one of many directions after that. Like there are some people who find their way back to a different form of uh, a more grace filled, loving tradition of some kind. Or there are some people who are like, fuck the whole thing. I want nothing to do with it. So, you yeah. know, uh, yeah. So how about, you know, in your situation? Um, well, you know, I had, like I said, I had older siblings who were very into pop culture and music and film, much to my mother's dismay. So I remember seeing MTV from a very early age and being immediately just captivated by it. I remember, I specifically remember 
seeing the premiere of Smells Like Teen Spirit on MTV when I was yes was ninety one. I was I was eight years old, and <laughs> it was kind of haunting and scary. And I was like, "Who are these guys?" And I would I couldn't even say I necessarily like liked it, but it was alluring to me. Like this is this is like real rebellion here. I could just tell like, this is the complete antithesis of everything that I'm being raised to believe. And it became like MTV became like this forbidden fruit. And from, from a very early age, I would watch MTV being completely just hypnotized by it. So music very early on was like my portal to the outside world because my mom could, um, there was a lot of restrictions on my, um, intake of, of entertainment. So like no, certainly no R rated movies. A lot of PG 13 movies were a no, no. And even outside of that, anything that had any sort of, um, dabbled any at all with the, with, uh, the occult. I wasn't, you know, I didn't see ghostbusters well into my twenties because ghostbusters even though it's a comedy movie it was like it's dealing with evil spirits that way if you watch <laughs> that just that will really invite to be able to see that <laughs> yeah and embarrassing too to call myself a comedian i've never seen one of the you know most renowned uh. comedy films of all time but it's like you know you watch ghostbusters you're inviting evil spirits into your home you can't listen to led zeppelin because they talk about the occult and jimmy page bought alistair crowley's house and if you listen to led zeppelin the evil spirits are going to transmit through your headphones directly into your brain like constantly being inundated with the threat of being overtaken by evil but music was very, very alluring and also something that was much easier to get away with, you know, because I could listen to the radio at a low volume in my room. You know, I could go to the mall with one of my older siblings and get a CD and sneak it home and be able to listen to that or listen to it on my disc man. My mom still, any music that she was aware of, she would immediately comb through the liner notes and if she saw any explicit language, straight into the garbage. I wasn't allowed to sell it, resell it or anything. It was just like, nope. This is your punishment. You spent money on this filth. It's going straight into the garbage. But music was definitely, and still is, it's, that's like my my main my main portal to the to the outside world. So that I I really kind of, and I remember as a as a I was eleven years old at the time. I remember being at a Jehovah, Jehovah's Witness party. Their big party are, is is graduation parties, high school graduation. And I think the reason they celebrate that so much is because you're finally free of you know secular education. Now you can really reimmerse yourself in the organization. There's no other distractions now. So high school graduation parties. That's that's like the biggest celebration of your life outside of you know I don't know. I guess a wedding ceremony. I remember going to some kid's high school graduation and uh, it was when Woodstock 94 was taking place. And at 11 years old, I remember sneaking up to my friend's parents' bedroom and turning on the television and watching, you know, live footage on MTV of Woodstock 94 and just being like, oh my God, like those people are, they're, they're free and they're expressing themselves and they're like, they're, 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 they're giving art to the world and look how much these people look to them like, gods and like everything about it was just like man i want i want that so bad um so that definitely kind of planted the seed in me also in terms of like a you know being involved in the arts and performing and i don't have any real musical ability but i knew that i wanted to be involved in some aspect of performance from a from a pretty early age um and then so what was it what was the part two of your question I'm sorry. So, yeah. So, wh- after all of that, you know, where do you find yourself now in terms of oh. um, how you view spirituality and things of that nature? Right, right. So, when I left, when I was 20, after feeling so burned by organized religion and really just the idea of of God in general, I just went out with two middle fingers aimed at the heavens. You know, I wanted nothing to do with God or spirituality of any sort. Um, and then when I left, I kind of completely went off the rails, you know, as a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses do, just trying to make up for lost time. So drinking, drug, sex, just trying to get it all in after being, you know, not able to acclimate at a, at a reasonable rate 
starting in a fairly early age, you know, living a normal adolescence where you're kind of dipping a toe in the water and assimilating to adulthood, it was like basically going from a, a child to, oh God, the world is my oyster. I can just fucking gobble it all up. And it can be extremely, it can be really damaging. There's a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses that wind up alcoholic, drug addicted, uh, uh, suicidal because they're not able to handle they're they're not able to uh they're not equipped with a skill set to function in the outside world and it's extremely overwhelming and they just get consumed by all these things that they were that were forbidden growing up and they they don't know how to utilize anything in moderation you know it's just it's just gobbling it all up with tenacity So I was no stranger to that myself. I moved to New York to do comedy. And when I came here, I saw what New York had to offer. And I was just a full-blown alcoholic whore for four years. Like I said, just trying to make up for lost time. And, um, you know, eventually settled down. I'm married. I have an eight-year-old son. And I am, uh, I'm actually seven months months sober. And a big part of sobriety and recovery is spirituality and and looking to a higher power for guidance but another thing that comes with that is being able to redefine that higher power so after growing up with with god being this vengeful punishing judgmental man in the sky being able to redefine my higher power as just the universe and not something that's against me but something that's actually guiding me and just much greater than me in terms of, I just kind of take tremendous comfort in insignificance and that nothing I do or say really has any real ramifications on the universe as a whole. Um, And so now spirituality is a huge part of my life and I pray every day, which is something that I never thought I would do again. You know, I get on my knees and pray every day to a very different God And, um, I, it's, I'm living a life now that I never thought I would in terms of praying, constantly trying to connect with a higher power, meditating, and it still feels weird, you know, uh, (laughs) it really does. It still feels like I, I, and I, and I have to catch myself too, when I pray from not reverting back to this knee jerk reaction of starting my prayers with dear Jehovah. You know, I'm like, oh yeah. no, that's not who you're praying to anymore. You're not praying to Jehovah. This is your God, man. You've you've redefined it. This isn't this isn't Him. Uh, this isn't something you're like subservient to. This is something that's greater than you, but can guide you and direct you so that you don't feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. And and not having to end my prayers with in Jesus' name, Amen. You know, it's it's my approach to it is very different, and my expectation. Um, is very different. And I also, I just don't feel like I'm being judged and watched the way I once was. I feel like it's something that can, you know, hold my hand and, and guide me on the right path. And it's, um, yeah, I was in, I was in a really dark place for a long time and, and I really, and I really saw the, the ramifications of, of my upbringing after wanting to deny it for a long time. When I first left, I didn't even want to talk about it. I was like, yeah, I was raised Jehovah's Witness. It's just a weird religion. No big deal. Completely denying the massive impact it had on my psyche and my, the way I handle relationships, the way I relate to people, the way I feel about myself. And so through, you know, years of therapy, uh, uh, a, n- a newfound approach to <clears throat> spirituality and recovery and, and also through doing the podcast and talking to other people that have had a uh, similar experience, it's really been tremendously helpful to me. But yes, yeah, spirituality is, it's a big, it's a big part of my life now. And I never thought I would say that. Wow. That's, that's a remarkable, uh, turn of events and, and just, a incredible story. So I know we've got, a. uh, other things to get to here in a, in a few minutes. So I want to be uh, aware of your time and, uh, but I appreciate you coming on. This is fascinating. Uh, tell people real quick, where can they go to stay up on top of what you're up to your comedy, your podcast, all that good stuff. Sure. Um, so I, uh, as with, <laughs> 
as with many other things that I've battled uh, uh, addiction problems, I have limited myself to one social media platform. <clears throat> trying to exercise moderation in the world of social media. So you can follow me on Instagram at who Doug Smith. And that's basically where I post all my links to upcoming live shows, uh, podcast clips. There's, there's links to my, uh, podcast website on there. Um, but yeah, podcast is called Jehovah boy. Uh, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash at who Doug Smith. I got a Patreon going now with, with all sorts of bonus content for the podcast, patreon.com slash Jehovah boy. So, uh, yeah. Um, if you, if you come from a religious extremist upbringing and you want to hear more tales of, of people, um, uh, sharing their religious trauma, Jehovah boys, it's the pod for you. And it's been, it's been a blast to do. And this is, this is great too, man. It's great to be uh, a guest on someone else's pod as, as well. So I appreciate what you're doing as well. Thanks, man. I, yeah, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. And, uh, again, thanks for your time today. I appreciate you coming on. No problem. Thanks, John. When did the size of our buildings become a foundation we laid? No church, tell me what made us think that we could keep others away. What have we done? No church. When will we ever see? Until we're all treated the same, that nobody is actually free.
that be 